Hello, everybody. Um, I was expecting Jesse to be here, but um, he's not. So I've been told to just start. So bear with me for a moment whilst I just get set up. I'm going to check everyone can hear me okay yeah i'll assume everyone can hear me i am it i am so sorry i was talking to a room at the other side <laughs> oh it's okay no worries i'll let you introduce me in then <laughs> hey everybody that's all met i'm jesse i'm going to give him the floor this is going to be a really good talk i am so so sorry about that I assumed it was still in the same space. So um, now that I figured out which ends up, I met from Tyke. This should be a great talk. I was mentioning that you guys just launched this cool federation tool a couple of uh, days ago, I guess. Um, maybe that'll show up or something. But yeah, I met. Take it away, please. Um, thanks very much, um, API Days, for having me. So I'm just going to share my screen again now. Uh, Allow. No, I don't need to. Presentation. Play. So, hello, API Days. Um, my name's Albert Somali. Um, I've spent several years helping folks like yourselves getting up to speed with uh, modern API management best practices. More recently, uh, I look after technical research and development within Tight's product leadership team. So, are you thinking about GraphQL? Uh, we have been and serve our customers. So we went ahead and did some research um, in the space to get our heads around it. So I, ideally that you don't have to. In this presentation, I'm going to be covering topics from some success stories, security considerations for your GraphQL API, how to apply GraphQL um, in a team or platform context, and how our journey evolved to what we call the universal data graph. So in 2019, Airbnb software engineer, Bree Bunch, she said that about 5.8% of all Airbnb traffic involves GraphQL. She expected that number to reach 10% by the end of last year. Before GraphQL, only 10 to 15% of their front end code um, contained actual business logic. The rest was data handling and boilerplate. So GraphQL helped them to regain productivity by reducing non-business related code. GraphQL has become Shopify's technology of choice for building APIs. I'm not going to read the entire quote. You can do that for yourselves. But some key takeaways are reducing the number of round trips to the server, a strongly typed schema, and helping find and fix bugs before it affects Shopify's merchants. And we all know and love GitHub. It offers probably the world's second best known GraphQL API after that of Facebook. GraphQL has enabled integrators to gain access to the data they need. GitHub still offer a REST API alongside their GraphQL API. I want some of that too, I hear you say. So you're sold on GraphQL. How might you go up about hooking up a REST API, for example? Maybe design and implement your schema, connect your data source, um, write query and mutation resolvers, ship to production. Easy, right? Um, I'm pretty sure that we're missing something here. I could have spent this entire talk and more advocating about GraphQL and painting a picture through rose-tinted glasses, but that's not what I'm here for today. According to Google Trends, we can see that interest is steadily increasing with a bit of a COVID-19 blip. Given this apparent silver bullet, um, why isn't it exploding? All the success stories you hear out there, just why is interest in the technology not more exponential? Adopting GraphQL is not without its pitfalls. There are considerations for security, performance, and separation concerns. Who is responsible for what? Many of these problems, which have been long solved with REST, they're still truly in their infancy with GraphQL. The key, key takeaway for me is that each organization um, that I've mentioned previously and more, um, they accomplished what they did on their own, in their own way, using experts, and at a terrific cost. There's simply far too much to think about and address before just diving in and publishing your GraphQL API. So Tyke's initial goals were to understand where API management fits with GraphQL, how we can go about helping our customers to ensure that they can safely and quickly ship their GraphQL APIs 
using these tried and tested API management best practices, which we all know. So let's take a look at some of the challenges that Tyke um, aims to address alongside why we think they might be particularly difficult for GraphQL APIs specifically. We've been talking to a lot of our customers, um, including retail, finance, government, across the globe, um, both seasoned GraphQL early adopters and those who plan to start using the technology very soon. I'm sure most of you here today are in one of these camps. So this is far from a complete list, but I've highlighted some uh, six items, which I think is actually throttling the mass adoption of GraphQL. Who owns the graph? The front-end developers, back-end developers, or the API product manager? How do I ensure governance for the GraphQL API without sacrificing agility? Do I need experts to manage the graph? Authentication, where does this occur? Authorization, should I be implementing authorization centrally or within my services, or maybe both? Protected introspection. Should, um, is it desirable to be publishing my documentation to the outside world? Denial of service protection. How do I protect my server from becoming overloaded due to complex queries or bad actors? And how do I ensure quality of service for all of the consumers of my graph? And then schema traversal attacks. Can an attacker obtain information that they're not supposed to in some other way? So your front-end team want to consume this GraphQL API. Front-end teams or full-stack developers, they often own the GraphQL endpoint um, for their application. GraphQL is typically a facade to the underlying backend services, a niche backend for front-end. So where your front-end developers are responsible for the graph, they then become responsible for the security and the management of it. With the mantra, you built it, you own it. This might be fine for frameworks and indie developers and startups, but it doesn't quite cut it for GraphQL in the context of teams, enterprise use cases, and platforms and ecosystems. So given the success and um, value of our shiny new GraphQL API, the business wishes to publish a subset of it to a partner. How do I, uh, should my front end developers be responsible for securing the graph, nurturing it and publishing that to those third parties? We've seen several cases where organizations who want to publish a subset of their graph have effectively architected a new niche GraphQL API specifically for that use case. Now, by handling, handing the responsibility of the GraphQL endpoint to our backend teams, this induces the possible necessity to re-architect our brownfield applications. It introduces tighter coupling and deep coordination between front-end, back-end, and external consumers. Um, we also have many new roles which have been created of recent years, such as the API product manager, the DevOps. What about API governance? Where do they all fit into this GraphQL picture? How can the API platform team get involved to quite create wider value for the business. A super quick refresher on what authentication and authorization is and the difference between them. Um, authentication is about verifying who you are and authorization is about establishing what you can do. In this diagram, um, which I've borrowed from a Medium article by the Guild, we've got a HTTP server that receives requests and then sends the request onto the GraphQL server, then onto our business logic. Let's take a moment to think about where authentication belongs in this request flow. So consider where, wherever you put authentication, it will impact both the behavior and the flexibility of your system. Now type being an um, API gateway and management platform, we're quite opinionated in this regard, but the rea you know, others do it in, in, in other ways. Um, from our perspective, by implementing authentication in your business logic, you open up a plethora of problems relating to, say, refactoring, breaking up into microservices, and then the necessity to re-implement that in, within each microservice. Um, if you go ahead and implement authentication between your HTTP server and your GraphQL server, then, then you should be able to validate that the request is authentic by using maybe a third-party identity provider, and then you get the added benefit of being able to pass the current user and various attributes as necessary to your underlying services. Let's talk about authorization. Um, in this example, we've got a library with books. A librarian should be able to add new books to the library. And the librarian will have their own application to perform CRUD operations in the library, on the books in the library. But a student shouldn't be, um, whilst they should be permitted to browse, search, and maybe even reserve books from the library, they certainly shouldn't be able to create, update, or delete any of the books. Um, 
they pr should, probably should only get read access to a subset of the fields that the librarian would have access to. So with REST, you've got methods and paths, which you can protect with different permissions quite easily. But with GraphQL, because the query is in the body of the request, how would you go about protecting the library from the general public being able to modify and delete their books? Does this logic belong in the data source? Um, should each microservice or, or resolver, should each microservice need to apply its own authorization logic? And as your graph grows, how do you maintain visibility? Do you need a separate policy server? And if your GraphQL server of choice happens to solve, uh, to support authorization, which specific features of it should you be using? We at Tyke think that a uh, GraphQL API uh, aware API gateway is ideally positioned to handle both authentication and at least be the policy enforcement point for authorization. It can be done in almost the same way as a typical REST call, which you're all familiar with. We can have our centralized IAM solution, uh, meaning that we can validate the token, check user groups, attributes and scope, validate it with a centralized policy server, and all being well, pass the relevant user information onto the GraphQL server. Let's have a look um, at my fictitious and very, very naive uh, schema and query above. Um, imagine I'm only allowed to view my own bank balance. Yet my query shows two ways in which I can access um, the bank balance field. Um, one via my um, through my user friends, and then one by querying friends directly. So assuming that I can protect this field, how can I also ensure that as my graph evolves, I'll not be accidentally opening up a new entry point to the bank balance field or any other restricted field for that matter. Unfortunately, as can be seen from the uh, screen recording, causing havoc on a GraphQL server isn't too difficult without a proper means of rate limiting or limiting the complexity of a query. There are many strategies to address this, um, and a handful of examples might include evaluating the complexity of the of query by maybe the number of raw, raw bytes in the request. Um, maybe you would do it by allowing, um, allowing clients to send, say, a thousand points worth of requests per hour, for example, so you add a score to the complexity of the query. And a third way, and the way that Tyke has introduced for our initial release is the ability to limit based on the query depth. So an internal user might be able to send more complex queries than a third party, uh, a third party such as a public developer or partner. And third party developers, maybe, um, maybe they're on a pro paid subscription and they'll be allowed to send more complex queries than say a free or trial account. Maybe you're monetizing access to your services or your APIs are being designed for public consumption. For this, you need a public facing developer portal. Now, normally um, in REST based services, you'd be, you'd be publishing a Swagger documentation for your developers to browse, um, discover the capabilities of the API. We've got documentation for free, but with a protected API with granular permissions, why not present only the documentation that the to access token is permitted to access? And back to security though, in the majority of use cases, you might just be looking to implement um, your back end for front end. So in this scenario, maybe you don't want the outside world to be able to query the schema or, you know, to, to be able to query the schema for your graph from both a security perspective and also to help protect um, your intellectual property. So I hope that I've given you lots of things to think about. Um, going back over the list above, how many of these have anything to do with your business and solving business problems? And how many of these problems might be better abstracted away um, and centrally managed by your GraphQL aware API manager? So as we continue con engaging with the community, clients and prospects, we realized quite quickly that in addition to the ability to secure a GraphQL API, our customers needed something more. The reality is that probably 99% of the APIs that we consume are brownfield services. Building an ecosystem with integrated components um, are fundamental requirements in the digital transformation of enterprises. Probably 15 to 20% of web services still use SOAP today. And not everything is legacy either. REST is still king, microservices in increasingly communicate over gRPC, 
What about my Kafka topics and rabbit exchanges? So whilst GraphQL might provide the consumer with a blissful utopia um, and that next level experience, I don't believe there's currently a truly scalable solution to the integration problem. Unless, of course, I'm happy with that niche packet for front end, and I'm happy to rewrite my services, build my facades, and possibly be forced to introduce Node.js to my stack. Um, it's simply impractical and it's expensive to replace all of your existing systems by building them from scratch, solely for the purpose of coding middleware um, to create that backend for front end. We see a lot of guidance on the web on how to migrate or rewrite your services to GraphQL, but not much in the way um, of how to go about composing GraphQL APIs from what you already have. After all, connecting your data to your users is what this is all about. The concept of the universal data graph at Tyke was born. Um, why can't we make it easy for our customers to have their own GraphQL API, be able to use it internally, publish for others to consume, and be able to publish their entire estate, whether REST, SOAP, GRPC, Kafka Stream, or more, without any of the pain or the necessity to have experts managing and maintaining the graph, and at a fraction of the cost, easily pluggable into your CI/CD pipelines. So with that in mind, I'd just like to take you through the final moments of this presentation with a quick snapshot of Tyke's new GraphQL engine. Imagine what an API product manager, platform team, or even a developer can, um, can get started, um, getting started with GraphQL can achieve in just a few moments with zero code. So if you just bear with me for a moment, I'm just gonna set up my demo. And you should be able to see my type dashboard in my development environment. Praying to the demo gods, I'm going to be creating a new API. And this API, um, I'm going to be uh, composing a brand new API. Um, and it's going to be for this service called uh, Trevor Blades. And what Trevor Blades allows me to do is query a country. In this example, I'm querying Germany. I can see um, the, the country code, name, continent, um, lots of information about, about the country. I can send that request. So I'm gonna compose a GraphQL API from this service. So we can start. Um, I'm gonna call it API Days Interface. So I'm very original. And I'm gonna create a new GraphQL API and I'm gonna be composing this new GraphQL service. I click Configure API, and I'm just gonna quickly scroll down and disable authentication for the purposes of this demo. I'm pressing Save, I head in, and now I go straight into the schema designer. So from here, um, I'm going to cheat um, just for brevity and find the country type. I'm gonna copy that, and I'm gonna paste that in there. And I don't want this because I don't want to implement everything. So I'm going to be publishing a subset of this, um, of the graph. And I'm missing a query. So um, type query and country code um, ID and this will be returning the country. And then I click on data sources. And what you can see, we've also got a visual designer, so we can also um, design, our, um, design our schema via a point and click GUI also. And what you'll see here is an exclamation mark next to the, um, the, the country type here. So we can see that a data source is required for this particular query type. I can click on the pencil, click on data source, define my data sources, and my data source type is going to be a GraphQL service. And what I can do now is paste the URL of our GraphQL API in here, and then update that field, and then hit update. Then we can head over to the playground, and I can write my query. and then I can send that. So 
after a while, um, adoption of my um, of my new API is or my new GraphQL API is um, is growing. But um, I find that I need some extra capabilities for this particular um, for this um, for this particular um, country type. I want to add. Um, I want to enrich this particular um, country type with some more information. So we have another service that I want to enrich this with. So I can head over to the schema. Um, and in the schema, I want to grab the borders of the country. And this is going to return an array of string. And I also want to, um, I think it's called flag. I want to get the flag of the, um, of the country also. And you'll be aware that obviously borders and flag doesn't actually exist on this, um, on this Trevor Blade service. But what I've got is a REST API. Which, um, which I can enrich this with. So I can click on borders, I can scroll up, attach a data source, define a new data source. And what I've got is a, um, a, I, can, I can hook into services, this REST API, which Tyke is already managing on my behalf, Tyke REST. And I can choose my REST countries. And using the GoText template, I can take the object, which refers to this country object here, dot code and I want to send a get request to that endpoint and I want to enable field mappings to be able to get the borders and update that field. I want to do the same thing for the flag. So I'm going to define a data source and use a predefined template here. Scroll down, enable field mapping and choose flag and update that field. I can update this API, head over to the playground, and now, fingers crossed, demo gods, um, I can query the flag and the borders, and I can send that request. And you can see that I have pulled in the uh, URL of the flag from my REST API and also the borders of Great Britain. I can do the same for the US as well to show you that I'm not cheating and it's actually working. So um, heading back over to the presentation, I really wish I had the um, time to show you more, um, such as taking our GraphQL API, integrating it with the GritOps workflow, um, you know, with this declarative syntax, um, the ability to publish between environments or, you know, securing this GraphQL API also. Um, but if you have any questions or wish to see how we've addressed some of the challenges that we've mentioned in my presentation you can free to feel free to grab me in the booth after the talk um if you're to take anything away from my presentation today i hope it is that adopting graphql isn't something you just turn on graphql is a journey and it involves multiple stakeholders within the organization everything i've showed you today is available for you to use for free um, and all you need to do is sign up for a free tight cloud account I urge you to all to have a play, get in touch, and we'd all love to hear um, what's on. So thank you very much. Any questions? I, I think that you have some uh, spies in the chat. Not spy, but your coworker, I'm guessing, uh, Matt Tanner, has been tackling the questions furiously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that Thanks, was good. works out really well. Um, uh, that was an amazing talk. Uh, tools like that are exactly what the community needs, what GraphQL needs to be able to implement, to embrace it early on, to work around these issues that are present in GraphQL uh, and be able to to get the best of both worlds, you know, uh, solve patterns applied to new technology is, uh, is a fantastic thing. I've played around with the dashboard. It's, it's really great um, and uh, encourage everybody else to try it out as well. Uh, I will um, move us on to the next speaker, but I want to say thank you so much for the talk. And uh, they do have a booth. So if you have any questions, go find them. This is a great feature of the platform we're in. Uh, go find them and you can ask them all the questions you would like. I'm sure they would love to chat and uh, and answer any questions you may have over there. So thanks again, Ahmed. That was a great talk. Thank you very much for having me. Cheers. So next up, we have uh, Vishaka from PayPal talking about how GraphQL helped them deliver a faster 
uh, checkout experience, which should be just a real great brass tacks. How does GraphQL apply uh, in the real world? So uh, moving this along, since I got a late start, uh, welcome Vishaka. Hey, hi. Um, Jesse, are you able to hear me? I can hear you. You're good. Hey, okay, thank you. I would be sharing my screen um, in I'll just a second. Share. Yeah. All right, you're all good. Is it all visible properly? Just going to make sure that it's uh... all right. Hope this is fine. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is and I work as a software engineer at PayPal. Um, but I would like to thank you guys for uh, joining in and welcome. Um, we have been using uh, GraphQL in production for over two years now. Uh, soon after its adoption, we realized it's um, benefits not only with respect to the performance, but also developer experience. This is what brings me to talk about how we are building a fast experience at PayPal with GraphQL. So uh, before I dive into the how, let's talk about uh, what we actually improved. What you're, screen, uh, what you're uh, seeing on the screen are several variations of the PayPal buttons. Uh, these buttons are to a PayPal's led to a PayPal's checkout experience. This is this was the state of our uh, buttons several years back. I don't know about you, uh, but I cringe every time I look at them. Uh, some of them were created by us. Some of them were created by merchants, hope uh, hoping to optimize their checkout experience, and probably some of them should have never seen um, the light of the day. Since then. Um, the good news is that uh, we've completely re-architected PayPal checkout integrations. Post a bunch of uh, a few of our uh, libraries. You, you could check out the these GitHub repos after the. These libraries truly uh, build cross-domain components. What these modules basically do is create buttons inside an iframe, which gives us a lot of advantages. Um, perfection is one of them. Now, all the buttons are HTML and CSS, uh, CSS and SVG powered. So no matter what device you are on, you're going to be seeing very, very crisp images. I am not going to be talking about branding here because constant brand recognition is uh, pretty obvious stuff. But the, uh, but the consistency in these buttons were really important. So we've built out several different variations of these buttons with respect to color, sizes, height, and all of that, which the merchants could use consistently. So we didn't have to worry about those terrible looking buttons anymore. And most importantly, these uh, buttons are sandboxed inside an iframe, which means that we don't need to be concerned about all the style sheets or code in the merchant's website, which could break, break us. Definitely uh, a nightmare. Um, I want to give a bit of a foreground of what we do before we jump on to how um, GraphQL fits in the picture here. We developed JavaScript Payments SDK for the merchants to drop on their websites. Uh, the Payments SDK Webpack bundles the entire code which is required to render our payment methods, uh, the buttons and everything, and the actual checkout flow experience and ship it back to the user. Once you click on the pay PayPal button, what you get redirected to is the login page. You log in yourself, pay for your stuff, and get back to the merchant site. Since merchants across the globe integrate with us, this offers uh, not only the PayPal button, but various other uh, regional payment methods. So uh, these are the few lines of code which the merchants would need to render our payment methods on their website. The URL you're seeing between the script tag here uh, under, under the script tag gives access to a lot of code. Um, and uh, we render our entire experience in uh, less than 200 milliseconds with the help of uh, GraphQL servers. This is also quite a high volume application, close to 100 million requests a day. 
so this is definitely a lot of um uh, packaging and bundling in a very very uh, short period of time so uh, the problem we are uh, trying to solve here let me get back um sorry Apologies for that. Um, the problem we are trying to solve here is that every time a person is trying to check out at a merchant's page, and if that uh, merchant offers PayPal, we want to be able to uh, render a customized checkout experience for the buyer. So a simple PayPal button, but much more than that. Now to decide what all possible payment methods can be rendered, package all of that code and ship it to the user's browser around the same time as when the merchant's page browser is a task. This is exactly what we will be discussing now. We needed a decisioning layer which could do all the heavy lifting for us. A bit of a history here um, before we proceed into the design. We had all of this implemented before we had all of this implemented in GraphQL. We had a REST API which did the same job but in a slightly laborious way. Not all the payment methods were defined in that API. The logic of some, for some of them was in the client side, some of them was in the server side, and some of them were config control, which required several pu separate pushes, app restarts to fl flush the config changes. With the growing number by this time, we had enough motivation to finally switch this over on the GraphQL server. Now, not, now let's look at the design uh, of the schema for determining the payment method eligibility. We defined um, funding eligibility at the root level, which accepts a bunch of inputs. Now, these inputs are a combination of what is provided by the merchants to us as part of the integration script. Remember the integration script we looked at at the beginning of the slide. The rest of the information is the buyer's profile, whatever information we could collect from the user's browser, country, cookies, etc. At the next level, we define uh, all the different payment methods uh, and our partnerships which are offered by PayPal today. Of course, these are not only PayPal's in, uh, internal products like PayPal Credit or Venmo, but also various other regional payment methods around the globe. And at the third level here are the descriptors for each of these payment methods which are mostly repeated across. These are eligible uh, which defines whether the particular payment method is true, uh, reasons behind it, and whether that particular payment method is recommended or not. Um, the schema, the, de the design of the schema, the way we designed it, uh, provided us a lot of benefits. A GraphQL query is executed in a top-down, breadth-first fashion. This very, very functionality available right of the box is essential for this API's performance. Every payment method here is backed up by the respective resolver function, and each of these resolver functions call their own downstream API services in determining the eligibility. Uh, by the way, a resolver is a function with respect to GraphQL, which retrieves data for a particular field. Uh, that is, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the field and the function, and it can help you fetch uh, data from any source you may have. And it returns various types of values, including null, arrays, promises, or scalar values. Next up was, was another out of the feature, uh, out of the box feature, which was query what you need. We have we have several uh, client applications here which query only for the payment methods and nothing more. This is this was a drastic uh, change from the pre previous versions of the REST APIs. Also, the design of a separate resolver function keeps all the implementation details of the payment methods fairly isolated. This has helped us not only in inner sourcing or collaborating between different teams, but um, also removes the risk of breaking someone in else in the process. We also implemented a bunch of caching techniques across different resolver functions, which I would be uh, discussing in the slide. Um, so in, in summary, because of how the payment methods are uh, sandboxed inside an iframe, and the eligibility dis, uh, decision layer backed by graphical merchants. We did, uh, merchants do not need to reintegrate with us every time we offer something new to the users. 
the entire graphql schema is extremely uh, scalable addition of new payment methods due to this we are able to provide an impactful checkout experience around the globe uh, through not only uh, paypal but also various regional payment methods i would uh, next be showing a, a few example of the different payment methods and different regional payment methods we uh, offer in different countries across the globe next up i would be talking about some of the optimizations we ended up doing at uh, the server side So one of them was memoization, and the other one is uh, caching. Memoization is just another type of caching, a technique which lets you cache uh, stuff in the context of the function, a uh, particular function, in this case, a request lifecycle. So I don't know if you guys can see. This is pretty much uh, the actual code we implement for the same. Uh, we uh, check or validate for certain inputs, create a cache key using that function's name and the inputs, and attach this cache to the express rec object. And that value hangs off during the duration of the request lifecycle. So every time we are about to call API, uh, we check for this, for this, find match for each, again, name and the inputs, and just read it off of that. This uh, technique is especially useful when we could still be calling the same APIs across different resolver functions for different payment methods. Next was caching. After uh, a few releases, we realized uh, that there were a few certain APIs response we knew were not going to be changing for at least a few hours. And for we have our own implementation of Redis memcache like storage called Mayfly. Uh, we store these data for, so we think of it this way. For a site, we cache persist a merchant's account information, which we know is going to be useful in determining the eligibility for a certain payment method for that merchant. And we store that data in, in our uh, Redis memcache like storage called Mayfly for a few hours, which is guaranteed to not change. So after the first request, every request coming during the duration of the cache gets the response, response which saves us a lot of memory uh, seconds in the process, ultimately helping in uh, faster payment uh, button render performances. Uh, earlier, we might have uh, known the number of times the API is required requested, but we didn't know which field of that resource was really required. We did not have enough insights on which part of the APIs were slow or pro problematic. So instrumenting an API is very important to know how it is performing and where it lags. We use Apollo servers, which provides us uh, with a feature called tracing flag right out of the box. This gives a uh, detail per resolve, like how it uh, takes to resolve that particular function, the number of time it's executed, etc. This is definitely a very, very uh, powerful insight. Uh, so I, if you guys can see on the screen, there are a few two screenshots. One is for the resolver duration and one is for the resolver count. So using that tracing flag, we pipe all that information we get over to tools like Grafana, which tells us um, the duration it took to uh, resolve a very specific particular spe uh, field in our schema and the number of time and the counts it is executed for a duration of time, say per minute or for an hours. Uh, so uh, using GraphQL uh, on our servers definitely helped us in giving us, providing us with really uh, powerful insights. Uh, next up, I want to discuss the four major benefits of bringing GraphQL on the table here. The very first is performance. This GraphQL decisioning layer is on the hot rendering path of the checkout experience, as I mentioned before. Uh, we have a, a very little amount of time to not only make the decision on what needs to be rendered, but bundle all of that and ship it to the user's browser. The various out-of-the-box features, uh, which we, again, uh, 
were discussed previously uh, using GraphQL on the server has provided us with a monumental performance uh, improvement. Next was uh, dev experience. We were uh, able to pick up and understand GraphQL uh, in a very short period of time. It did not require much of prerequisite knowledge. And due to this, my, my entire team, my sister teams could contribute and migrate to APIs, migrate APIs into GraphQL in a very, very short period of time. This made the entire adoption uh, process pretty smooth. Uh, the next was the flexibility. Okay, so only query for what nothing else. Biggest win for us, not only with respect to performance, but with the flexibility it provides. Uh, client applications have the freedom now to exactly choose the size of the data. This directly controlled controls the size of the script we actually webpack bundle because we select uh, the code for the different payment methods and their respective checkout experience, and which ultimately affects our rendering uh, speeds. And finally, is the evolution, uh, as I, which I see as one of the most important uh, benefit of. Um, using GraphQL for this, because there's no need to bump into major versions and maintain previous versions. You can incrementally, using GraphQL, you can incrementally make changes and then add its support back to the client. With companies with complex processes, we found out that a team is much likely to migrate in small bits of changes than something really big. The entire strategy plan we followed was incremental as well, where we started with a very small population and were falling back on older logic and then ultimately in, uh, incrementally migrating towards GraphQL. With such powerful insights through instrumentation, you know exactly which fees are continued uh, to be to being used and which are not. So you can very confidently deprecate APIs using the deprecated directive and inform that back to the client. With the rest, this isn't as uh, easy to do, uh, and you just end up extending your o APIs and overloading in the process and never deleting anything. So with this, um, I'd like to uh, conclude uh, my talk here. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg on how we are uh, using GraphQL in making our uh, making better uh, experiences at PayPal. Also, just a, a small little uh, note here that uh, PayPal is hiring. So if you are interested uh, in GraphQL, uh, React, and other fun, fun tech, please come chat with me. Uh, this is a link you uh, guys can uh, check out and learn more about it. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And um, uh, op I'm open for uh, your questions now. And we have time for questions. <laughs> so, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Give this a minute here. Anything you don't like about GraphQL? Anything I don't like about GraphQL? Um, I've been uh, working uh, with GraphQL for the past one and a half years, and the entire, just the the migration and the this was pretty easy. I would still say that in an org uh, where there are implementation of a GraphQL server and and you have to make something, make your schema layer or your design a part of it, you might have to go through certain steps. But give an example, like a, at least in our in our org, uh, we have a mid-tier application which implements various different schemas. And we kind of have to make sure that there are no overlapping use cases. That is, no two different teams are uh, trying to solve the same problem through two different approaches. So in, a, in an entire code base where different teams are collaborating,
contributing towards migrating all their previous APIs now into GraphQL. It is a bit of a challenge sometimes to design the schema, which uh, solves issues for everyone in the audience so that there is no kind of duplication, if that makes sense. So trying to trying to make it which is scalable enough, which is inclusive enough without uh, having redundancy is something which I think uh, has been a challenge for us uh, as our code base is just uh, growing every day. That, that seems like a, uh, a reoccurring pattern is that when people start to embrace the flexibility of GraphQL, then it becomes, oh, now I have to design this thing uh, a little oh, yes. bit differently. And, uh, it was pretty easy. The, the entire production cycle for us is pretty easy. We design the schema, code it out, and it goes in production pretty quickly. Uh, so I think just the ease, you know, that the ease of doing it makes it so easy that people are pretty open and I think... Um, less restrictive about what they are contributing at the end of the day. So I think that has been a challenge which we are constantly working towards. Very good. That that was a fantastic talk. I appreciate it so much. Thank um, thanks, thanks for coming. And uh, if you have any questions for Vishaka, just please uh, message her in the chat. And um, you can also find her on Twitter, quite active there as well. So thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next up, we have Roy, who has been at a lot of conferences that I've organized. Roy gives a fantastic talk, uh, and he'll be talking specifically about his experience implementing GraphQL in the tech stack for the city of Amsterdam, which sounds like a pretty darn cool uh, gig, to be totally honest. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to him so I can get started here just about as on time. And the uh, floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Jesse. So yeah, hi all. Nice to be here. Let me figure out how to share my screen. So I guess that's about it. It's more tricky to find out how it is. So I guess, yeah, Jesse, are you seeing my screen now? Just to be sure. I guess that's a yes. So yeah, I'll be talking about GraphQL for cities and also GraphQL for other public organizations because um, probably not all of you are working for your local city and maybe you're working for other public organizations, maybe for health organizations or like uh, big banks or insurers that also are considered public organizations. So who's this actually for? So one of the things we noticed when I started working at the city of Amsterdam is that open sourcing is more than just uh, putting all your code in GitHub and, and just put it on there without any additional information. That's something a lot of companies do. They're saying, hey, we're open sourced. But then again, they just put all the code in GitHub without any documentation, which makes it really hard for other people to understand and value your code. So that's something to understand before starting this talk. So a little bit about myself. So just you already introduced, I'm working for the city of Amsterdam where we create all sorts of open source APIs, uh, web applications, and also GraphQL, which I'll talk to you about later. I also teach React and GraphQL for the React GraphQL Academy, and I work with some other companies. But next to this, you can also find me on Twitter where I tweet a lot about React, JavaScript, TypeScript, and of course, GraphQL. So Amsterdam, so maybe Amsterdam, like uh, this talk is being recorded in multiple time zones. So today, so at this moment we're recording um, also in the US and you might not know Amsterdam. Although Amsterdam is pretty fam f famous, I guess. But Amsterdam is a city in Europe, uh, in, the, in the country Netherlands and it has been there for a long time. So we're almost 800 years old and we almost have a million people. So maybe Amsterdam sounds really big. It isn't that big. It's just like 860,000 people, which isn't that much if you uh, compare it to London, which is pretty close, which is like over 10 million people. 
And just to make sure I'm not working for Amsterdam in the US, because apparently there is a city of Amsterdam in the US as well. So last fall, I was visiting Washington and I was trying to find the time to go to the city of Amsterdam in Washington, or at least close to Washington, but I couldn't find the time. And just to be sure, the city of Amsterdam in um, the US, it's, it's, way, it's way newer and it's pretty far away. It's like almost 4,000 miles or like 6,000 kilometers if you're from Europe. And we're known for a lot of stuff, uh, like probably you've seen beautiful canals or uh, all the old uh, kennel homes. And of course, cheese. And we also have particular drugs that a lot of people know us for, unfortunately. Uh, but we also do tech. So if you don't know this about Amsterdam, Amsterdam is a really big tech hub in Europe. Actually, it's considered to be one of the major uh, European uh, tech hubs. And... You can see this it's from um, some figures that I collected for you. So in 2017, we had like 60,000 people um, being employed by tech companies, which is which is pretty um, which is pretty good because it's almost 11% of the total labor market in Amsterdam. So you can consider Amsterdam as a big city. It's like 860,000 people, and we have 60,000 people working just in tech. So and it's even growing every day because more and more companies are going to Amsterdam especially with the whole Brexit scenario. You can already see a lot of companies moving from London to Amsterdam, um, or maybe that even to Berlin or Paris, but Amsterdam is pretty, is pretty popular among startups that are coming from other countries. And this tech, um, this tech uh, hype, you can also see it at local government. So the city of Amsterdam is clearly investing in tech because we have a lot of problems we want to tackle uh, by using tech. And some of these problems I can, um, I can show you later on. Uh, but most of the tech is being tackled from one, um, yeah, from one department. And sorry for this image; it's in Dutch. Uh, but basically, it's saying uh, the department is called Research, Information, and Statistics. And one part of that uh, is the part that I'm working for, and it basically handles data. So we're going to use all the research data, all the information from the city, and statistics, and we're going to extract the data and put it into uh, web applications, into APIs basically making it available to the world, um, but most of all, make it available to the people that are using it, like civil servants, people that live in Amsterdam, um, or even researchers for our universities. And basically this uh, department is making sure that all those, um, all those numbers are available somehow. Like it could be a web application, it could be like to extract data sets, it could be the public APIs I mentioned. And we also like to share knowledge. We should like to share a lot of knowledge because every, Every Thursday, we run a meetup. Uh, there are a lot of internal demos. There are demos at universities, at other places in town. So this is one of those demos. It's like um, a large part of the department that works on uh, our applications and APIs, basically showing what they've built, showing new technologies, showing how to get started with something. And when I just started over there, one of my first like internal demos was showing how to use GraphQL. Because GraphQL was already a hot topic. Some people were actually considering using it. But somehow they didn't really felt the need to do it because maybe some information was, le was uh, lacking in the organization. Or maybe some people just didn't like the concepts because REST is like a contract. So why make some GraphQL API that people might abuse? So these are all uh, concepts that you need to take away whenever your organization isn't using GraphQL already because probably they are really stick to REST APIs and they need to know the differences. They need to understand how GraphQL can actually help other people use your APIs and use your APIs in a way that they can actually create something out from it. And like I told you, we're developing our projects not only for the world, but mostly for our civil servants, for our researchers, and also for civilians. So we want to be sure that all the data that Amsterdam has is it about you, your neighborhood, or maybe the company you work for? If the data is public, we want you to be able to see the data, to even use it for your own good, or do whatever it, uh, what you want to do, because it's all open public data. So it should be shared with the world, and it should be accessible for people to use um, and make, um, yeah, make cool applications or other things from. And it's basically, this entire department is based on three pillars. So the biggest pillar is data, because there's a lot of data, um, it's being harvested all over the city, um, like from, uh, we have sensors under the roads, in the streets, there are probably cameras everywhere. I'm not sure if it's good or bad to have cameras all over your city, but 
uh, yeah, consider something goes wrong, then you're happy to camera has consider, um, yeah, it's, it is two ways, it's two sides like having cameras everywhere, but at least it generates a lot of data. And some of the things we do with our department is, uh, is um, using the harvested data and make information that people can use from it. So you want the data to be translated to information that everyone can read and understand and can do something with. Another part is knowledge. So we want all this knowledge that we gather from the information, from the data. Uh, we want the knowledge to share it with the world, want it to be available for everyone, uh, maybe in stories or maybe uh, with meetups or videos or by going to other departments and showing what's actually possible with all the information we have over there. So those are actually the three pillars this entire department is built upon. And like I told you, every city is facing problems, like every organization is probably uh, facing problems and those problems can be real good and the problems can be real big and they can be really small. So probably you're living in a city as well or maybe in a small village, then I guess you're lucky because you don't have to deal with all the big real problems from there. Uh, but some of the problems we're facing in Amsterdam um, in these beautiful canals is tourists. As you can imagine, a lot of people want to visit those beautiful canals. They want to see Amsterdam, they want to eat their cheese, they maybe want to um, go there for the drugs or the parties as well. And this is actually one of the most popular areas in Amsterdam. And uh, something we did over here is placing crowd control monitors everywhere. So the city can know how many people are in a certain street at each point of the day. And it's it's a pity I couldn't find the graph uh, easily because it's, you know, it was somewhere else. But you can see in this area that's actually purely based on tourists, it's almost empty now because due to the entire situation that we're also talking remotely with each other right now, um, this city is almost empty now because one of the things that tourists brings along, it's like people don't want to live in a tourist area because they want to live somewhere nice and quiet where they can actually enjoy their day and uh, do their work. And one of the things you see in those very crowded places is that people start living there again and everything starting up. So this problem was actually handled for us by uh, external means. Um, but we also create applications to handle these, uh, these problems ourselves. So that's why we use the crowd monitoring. So you can actually uh, monitor uh, how busy certain areas are and then take measures to get rid of some of the, um, some of the maybe dangerous uh, crowds. And something else we face is trash. There's a lot of trash everywhere and people start putting trash everywhere, especially if you have tourists. They leave trash everywhere in particularly because they somehow don't <laughs> seem to find where the trash bins are. And how to solve these problems. So like I told you, we gather all data about these problems and so we can handle them effectively. And one of the ways to handle those problems is putting signs everywhere. And in the end, you just want people to know what you can and can't do somewhere else. You need to be in English. Um, although, you're, although the language in the Netherlands is Dutch, we need to put on signs everywhere in English. But another way to handle problems is technology. And that's why we created all those public APIs, uh, those web publications. We created maps that you can use. So this is an example of some of the public APIs we have. And I don't know if you can actually see, but on the right, you can see the license. So we have different sort of licenses for our APIs because some APIs contain, um, contain information that's not for everyone. They need to have certain authorization in there because you don't want everyone to see an API, like who are your neighbors, how much money they make each year. Well, that would be interesting to see, but that's something we want to protect people from because the APIs are public, the code is public, but not all the data is public. So most of the data is public, but some data isn't. So that's why we have different licenses for each API. Um, but in there, there are over 35 public APIs. And those are just uh, usually just REST APIs. Some GraphQL, but most of them are REST APIs. And there are also uh, map layers in there or uh, even map servers. There are data sets that you can extract. Um, and this is all public information. I'll share the links with you later so you can have a look. And everything is open, like I told you. So maybe not all the data is open, but most of the stuff is actually open. You can find it on our GitHub as well. So if you would go to github.com and slash Amsterdam, you can already find like over 200 projects that are running right there, which are the APIs I mentioned. There's also applications or map servers or small services running somewhere and even some NPM packages. So one thing we did like a year ago, we started 
extracting small bits of code that we create and open source them to the world. So you can ask why, why are we actually doing this? That's because we want to enhance collaboration and we want to be transparent. Like as a government, you want to be transparent to your people. You want to know what information you have about them, like how they can exit it. And also we want it to be reusable. So as we're uh, a local government, we're being, um, our budgets are coming from tax and tax is paid by people living in the city. So people in the city don't want to, um, want developers like me to create a lot of code for a lot of their tax money and not think about reusability. So that's something we like to do in our open source, um, in our open source approach. And if you want to know more about this approach, it's like an entire manifest uh, that you can see on this website, where you can find out more about what do we think about collaboration, transparency, reusability, and even some more topics that are all uh, included in the whole open source debate. And also, like, of course, we follow European guidelines for open standards because we also work together with other cities, which is quite cool. Like some of our NPM packages are also used by other cities like Finland or Norway uh, or even Belgium, which is a bit closer to the Netherlands. And so if you're in the US, you probably have no idea which some of these countries are. Um, but yeah, it's a, a lot going on in Amsterdam and the rest of Europe in terms of open source development. So what I'm working on uh, is most of all the open data portal of the city of Amsterdam. So this data portal, basically it combines all the information that you can find about the city of Amsterdam through our APIs, through services or data sets on one website. And this website has um, information about data, it has data itself, it has interactive map applications. It is basically everything you can think about um, that you're, if you're looking at a city, like what kind of data can a city have about me? Like all those data can be found in this site. And this portal combines all the open data, uh, but it also uses all the public APIs that we just saw you. But if you know about REST, uh, like I told you, REST is a contract. And if you have a contract with someone to use all the data, you can imagine that if you're doing something particular with the data, then a REST API might not be the best solution for this. And that's why we started using GraphQL in our application. And we use GraphQL in a way uh, like you would know for backends for frontends something that we built on top of the public APIs just to make sure that we only get the information we need and we don't need to load like several APIs every time uh, we start using um, a new public API in our application. And this backend for front end, or you can call the data layer. Uh, you can also, there are multiple ways to call this. It's like uh, inside of us, inside of our application, we usually call it um, like the search layer or the data layer. And basically what it does, it's using the graph approach of GraphQL, like, you know, GraphQL, it's about graphs, uh, and we're using it for public API. So every public API um, can be wrapped to represent a graph. And using those graphs, you can bring those graphs together. And there are multiple ways to bring graphs together. So you probably have all heard about Apollo Federation or um, like all the other approaches to bring certain graphs together, like remote schemas, uh, there are multiple ways to bring together graphs. So in our application, we chose to go with a monolith for now uh, because we're just starting this um, and we were the only team using those public APIs. But in the end, you can imagine we are the only team using those uh, specific GraphQL uh, layers. But you can imagine if we build more applications and you want stuff to be reusable, that we need to start thinking about something, either remote schema stitching or maybe a pull of federations. To bring together the graphs for every public API. But if you want to look at um, the architectural um, overview, I'll show it to you later. Uh, but most of all, let's look about what a data access layer or data layer, how actually you can define this data layer that we have. So there's a small definition for this that I took from the internet and it's probably, uh, yeah, it's talking about a data access layer, which is just a very common computer science approach to um, harvest multiple, uh, multiple sites of data into one access layer that can be used by software or an application, a computer program, whatever you want to call it. So if you look at the architecture for this, it basically looks like this. So on the left, we have our open data portal. Um, and on the right, you can see that we're using public APIs and those public APIs, they're doing multiple things. So sometimes public API is just getting data from a database. Sometimes it's getting data from other services. So you can imagine that we also use APIs from 
uh, other public organization in the Netherlands, like our health organization or uh, some departments of the national government. And we want to have all those services and databases, imports, experts. Uh, we have public APIs for them. And so every API, you could wrap the, every API with GraphQL and just like this. So you would have two schemas for every public API would have their own schema. And I don't know how pretty how much you know about the usage of GraphQL in API environments. Like uh, this is one approach, like using the multiple schemas per API. What we did, we used data loader. And with GraphQL data loader, you can actually use, um, yeah, you can use data loader to create loaders for every API. So what we've did, we've created a loader for every API. So one API could be to get information about a certain data set. Another API could be to get information about uh, public records from uh, maybe a home or maybe like a public office of the city. And we wrap those things in data layers, or you can also wrap them in um, into your own GraphQL APIs. And then you can actually read those data from a, read those data from a data layer. So we have this data layer is using multiple GraphQL APIs or just one GraphQL API, and it's bringing everything together. Because all those APIs, they need to be read, they need to be normalized. Um, sometimes they're built by different teams. So this data layer is picking up all the hard work for us and is actually normalizing the data, putting it all together and making it available for our front end or a web application to be readable. And this is basically because all those public APIs, they have their own schemas, they have their own um, way of working and that's one downside you have with large with large organizations so you want to have an api that's being that could be able to be used by as much uh, as much other people as possible but on the downside like making stuff generic making it to be used by a lot of people um, it's often very hard to use it for a specific uh, specific need and especially if you bring together multiple apis that are uh, being built for the world and you just want to use them in the small applications, um, then GraphQL would be a real good solution. But unfortunately for us, it wasn't possible to create all those public APIs, uh, both as a REST API and a GraphQL API because, because of many, uh, many reasons. So that's why we actually built this data layer that is using GraphQL for those different public APIs, bring it together in our data layer that we can use uh, however we see fit, and then read that from the, um, from the front end that we built. So some something we're working on now is making this data layer approachable for other people as well. So you can imagine that if you're of public APIs with REST calls, that some of those calls need to be combined every time just to get like a proper information. So in our application, you can you can have interactive maps. You can click somewhere on the map and you need to load data. And the data needs to be loaded from multiple public APIs. So you don't want to send around all those requests. And if you look at our... Um, and our code base, we have multiple applications doing uh, this kind of logic. So one of the things you're working on right now is creating sort of an API client for all those public APIs, which again will be a data layer based on GraphQL. And for us, that's a real good way to, um, on one hand, make public APIs that are available to the world and can fit like a thousands of needs. And on the other hand, uh, make a GraphQL API that can be used by specific applications just to get small parts of uh, different APIs or services and bring them all together so they can be used however the application sees fit. So for us, that was like the uh, the biggest difference by using GraphQL over REST. So tailoring those public APIs to user needs is something you can't do with REST. And that's where really GraphQL shows its strength and how it can help organizations to um, yeah, to make real use of their public APIs that are maybe used by somewhere else. And you can't just uh, deprecate a public API like that because maybe uh, someone built this entire company around it or maybe a department that doesn't have the tech, the tech people to, to build a new application based on that API. So GraphQL for us really is a way to tailor public APIs to user needs, which is something that probably every large or at least every public organization with public APIs um, can, can be helped by this approach. So can't this be done with, uh, without GraphQL? That's probably a question you get a lot by backend developers because most backend developers I like, uh, I know, um, they're really not open to the concept of GraphQL because they like the concept of having a contract or the REST API. So of course you can build just your own backend for frontend for, um, for one web application and don't use GraphQL. 
but then you're actually going to fall into the same uh, the same problems again because if you make a backend for front end for one application, then maybe the other week or the other year or in a few months, another department in your organization might want to make another application that's using specific APIs, and they will also build their own backend for front end, uh, which might also not be based on GraphQL. So maybe those um, those two backend for front ups could be combined and with GraphQL. You can still harvest all the um, yeah all the clear examples and all the clear um, yeah, the clear upsides of GraphQL without having to um, to create a lot of code that is isn't reusable um, and all everything needs to be um, yeah it takes a lot of time to maintain all those different APIs and different backends for frontends and in the end you would still have the problem that you have public APIs you have private uh, backend for frontends, and you have a lot of backend for frontends. They're all tied to certain applications. With GraphQL, we can really solve this problem in our organization, at least. So if you want to learn more about this, there are multiple ways to um, to do so. Um, because one thing I like to I like you to do is just, if you are um, if you like to know more about open source for cities, just really go to the, uh, to the website of the city of Amsterdam or the GitHub page I showed you later. Let me get this slide over here. Yeah, so the first link I have over here is really the Amsterdam GitHub where you can find our manifest. And in here we explain why open source actually, um, why it takes a big part in the organization and why we've chosen to go open source. And on our GitHub page, you can then find, uh, on our actually GitHub repository page, you can find all the projects that we created. And in here you can find public APIs, like I told you, you can find map services, you can find web applications, uh, but most of all, you can also find uh, some GraphQL APIs in here. And yesterday I had a meeting with one of the other people that's working on a very large data processing application inside the city of Amsterdam. And they actually managed to use GraphQL for streaming data. So that's even more interesting. So there's a lot of interesting stuff happening with GraphQL in our organization. And basically it all started just by um, having multiple internal demos showing how to use GraphQL and making people excited within the organization because that's in the end um, what this should be about, right? You can't have people in your organization use GraphQL, whether it's a city or a large company, without being enthusiastic about it. So the biggest thing, if you want your organization to start using GraphQL, just get everyone excited about the technology, about what you can do with it. Maybe try to create small demos, show through small interactions how people uh, can use those technologies. And yeah, just try to create uh, an environment where people want to learn and want to try new things. And then you will see if you're building APIs that have very specific needs uh, or very broad needs, you can maybe combine them with GraphQL and make them an op open to the world or open to at least some parts of your organization by using GraphQL to wrap, to wrap them all together. So that's most of the things I like to I wanted to talk with you about today. So as we hadn't that much time, I there's tons of other things I could tell you about GraphQL and how we're actually using it, but yeah, just go to the code examples. And if you want to know more about me, uh, maybe we have some time to ask questions, or you can find me on Twitter as well. Or just make sure to watch some of my talks at uh, at YouTube and have a look over there. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. That was great. We don't have any time for questions. <laughs> There's uh, this uh, this community. It's so passionate about their topics and uh, about GraphQL, and uh, they they filled in the the talk time quite well. Um, great talk. I mean, talk about a, a massive system to try to model inside of GraphCMS and represent data that is both actionable as well as representative of the the system. So. Uh, great talk. Really appreciate you coming on. And uh, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to uh, message him directly or on Twitter. Uh, and he's got a lot of talks on YouTube that are, are full of great content. Mm -hmm. So definitely check those out. So thanks, Roy. Yes, thank you all for listening. Yep. All right. So our next talk is uh, before the for the break is Jim Laredo from IBM talking about uh, enabling GraphQL for mass consumption. He has warned me that he has uh, inclement weather uh, where he is. So apparently there's massive thunderstorms there. Hopefully he will be able to maintain a connection with us today. Um, if he loses power, 
maybe you'll get a tour of graph cms or something like that but uh, we'll we'll see what we can accomplish so jim if you are able to go ahead and join the call here just uh, hit the uh, share video at the top top right corner and we'll get this next talk kicked off ah here i am there's Jim. All right. So without further ado, we will fight the weather and let you get right at it. Take it away, Jim. All right. Uh, let me see how I share here. Am I sharing? Not yet, right? Not yet. Where is that? All right. I think there's a button down there at the bottom yeah, in between yeah. the row. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Still. Is it getting there? Is it giving you an error or what's the... I don't see the PowerPoint, but uh, I say entire screen, only share screen with sites you trust. Okay, whatever. Um, We're trustworthy here. Okay, yeah, I know. No, eh? nothing yet. Not yet. You will up hop in to see your screen, window screen type. I mean, I don't see the PowerPoint to my choices. But uh, when I say entire screen is my only alternative. May just have to go with that, huh? Well, hold on a second. Let me... Why well, is not letting me? Let me just try something. I'm just I just picked something else, but it's not the PowerPoint. It's still not. Now the button is gone. Um, let me let me quickly switch to Chrome. Okay. I'm gonna quit this one. So as uh, Jim comes back so far, it's been a full day of, uh, of really impressive conversations. Um, let's, uh, let's try and do this again. I'd ask this in the other channel. How many people have actually seen all the talks so far? Anybody in the chat been, uh, been on it the whole way? Any true fans? They'd be, they'd be lying. <laughs> I've been here for the for all the talks. Hey, we have one. Oh, Hannah, that's my, that's my I'm hero. This day. All right, Jim, you're back. Okay, let's try it. I'm trying, I'm trying. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, we hear you. All right, so I mean, I, I want to encourage you. I mean, this next talk is also going to be very interesting, but uh, do stay for the very last talk as well. It's going to be a great uh, fireside chat with the CEO of Apollo, and uh, I'll be interviewing him. It's going to be a lot of really interesting topics in there, a lot around the idea of data modeling that's been discussed. Uh, so some really fascinating stuff in there, I'm sure. Um, yeah, that's going to be really great. And uh, the whole day is in full of a lot of a lot of good content. This is like trying to get a projector to work. Yeah, this is 
that about sums it up. <laughs> right. So I think I'm there. Hold on. Okay. Yes. Hey, I think I see the screen. Very good. All right. All right. I'm going to hop out and give you the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Sorry about that. I lost power for 10 milliseconds. Well, enough to cause all this craziness. <laughs> I'm Jim Laredo, uh, and I've been working at, at IBM Research. For the last three years, we've been working on GraphQL, doing all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and uh, we actually have a utility that transforms REST APIs into GraphQL. I really recommend it. But that's not the topic of this conversation. Um, so I'm going to talk about what is it going to take to get GraphQL to the next level? So I, um, I always looked around and see how GraphQL is doing. And we can truly say that GraphQL continues to, to rise. Um, I look at interest. I look at Google Trends. I look at uh, downloads and NPM. And we've been doubling year over year on, on the total downloads on, on the base GraphQL libraries and education. This is a graph from the GraphQL Foundation where uh, we're members of. And we basically monitor. We, 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 we offer a course that is free for anybody that wants to get trained on GraphQL, or if you want to pay a little more, you'll get a diploma too. I also go into the GraphQL Foundation, and they basically um, have this landscape view of all the uh, users and providers and enablers of, of GraphQL technology. Uh, if, if you use GraphQL, you want to be here, is you're just a pull request away um, to, to get your logo up there. But I wanted to peel the onion a little bit and see what, what are these guys doing and are, are they really enabling GraphQL for everyone to use? And so I'm going to take five use cases very quickly and, and see how they've been uh, working on that. Uh, the first one is GraphQL. I won't talk too much, but we know that they were driven by, about a client experience. They really wanted to improve the client experience of the mobile app, and basically that created all these uh, change and, and, and this uh, great contribution to the community. The next one I want to talk uh, about is, is PayPal. Pa PayPal is, is a story of, of productivity. Um, they basically uh, realized that uh, uh, by um, having this middle layer, they basically could uh, create a standard way to access data. And then they realized that they didn't have to spend so much time gathering data that they, that was what their UI developers were doing that they, they cut down and they, they're basically um, the, the amount they needed to develop a UI by, by substantial amounts. Next one is uh, Starbucks. Starbucks is, is a story of, of, of integration and, and culture. They, they realized they could continue to use all the investment they had in, in, in REST APIs but create a, a, a way to streamline their business logic, organize the data, and basically provide consistency across their platforms. And also they realized once they saw the light in, in their first uh, application that this was a, a way to basically uh, build for the future and continue to use GraphQL in, in other applications. Artsy, Artsy is a marketplace for art. Providers and, uh, of art can come in and, and, and sell their art, and, and you can go in and, and participate, buying, I think, even auctions. Uh, for them, it, 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 was, it was one of, of also the client experience. They realized that you, know, you could coalesce requests and, 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 and get your data quicker. And the way they put it, happy, happy users. Uh, and faster apps means happy users. Happy users means Basically, everyone's happy. But they also talk about uh, one of uh, you know development experience with the documentation and having basically a, 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 a live playground available and, and the docs available. I mean, you're, you're probably thinking GraphQL. And, and, and you know that, that's a big change for those that, of us that have used REST. Uh, finding the right REST API that, that is in sync with the service you're trying to access is not an easy task. And finally, I want to talk about Shopify. And uh, Shopify, an e-commerce provider, um, they basically wanted to extend their experience and, and the value they had obtained with GraphQL to their ecosystem. They wanted others to build uh, applications uh, with uh, the higher quality, with less code, uh, take advantage, take, find an easy way to 
uh, promote their documentation. And all those gains that they had uh, had internally, they wanted to promote them outside so their partners could build um, uh, applications just as fast. When, when we, we have this, this um, kind of landscape for the API economy, one of many at IBM, uh, but in this one, you know, you can break down the API economy in many ways. There, there are, of course, monetization uh, and business models. There is a, a whole aspect of uh, promoting and, and advertising uh, to encourage adoption of your API. Uh, but I want to, and, and then the, 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 what is the true enablers and what drives this API economy? And I want to focus on this last third. I mean, GraphQL APIs are API, so business models and monetization may change a little, but they're still API, so I'm not gonna touch in the middle one. I wanna touch to see if, you know, does GraphQL continue to enable and drive uh, uh, the API economy? So if I look at this from, from a point of view of drivers, we have these three dimensions. Um, we can see that the Shopify story fee, uh, 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 suits at the top, right? Creating ecosystems, making it easier, uh, faster. Uh, Shopify, of course, and PayPal bring that notion of speed to market, uh, faster turnaround and faster delivery. And uh, uh, from both face Facebook and Artsy, we, we see that the aspect of thinking about the customer and their experience and making sure that they can, uh, that those APIs change the way they, 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 their applications get built. Artsy as well uh, talked to us about uh, ease of development and, 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 and the tools available. And from Starbucks, we heard about uh, uh, how they were able to bring all the data together and, uh, and, and basically create a larger amount of data available to, to other, all of their applications. And of course, the, we heard that once they built the first one, they were ready to build more with uh, so, so we see that both we see drivers in these stories and we see that basically GraphQL is enabling uh, all, all those drivers. So if we go back to this landscape, <clears throat> you would think that, hey, everybody has probably an, a GraphQL API out there. And we all know that we don't see that many external GraphQL APIs. And uh, I, I actually, you know, survey through and, and all these guys have GraphQL APIs that's actually quite, not not enough, right? Not 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 too many, and uh, but it's not that they REST have not endorsed the API economy. They actually have, and but they still offer REST APIs. They're still not comfortable to offer a, a GraphQL endpoint that they can consume. Um, you know, everyone has their own reasons and and and, and maturity, but uh, you know, Facebook still offering a REST API. You look at it; it does look like a Facebook, a GraphQL endpoint wrapped around REST. But uh, um, nevertheless, it, it is probably because there are challenges. And so, if we, if I go back into all the survey that I did, I, I see, for example, uh, um, Starbucks. And Starbucks, you know, they said they were going to build more applications, and here's the the the, the tweeting about their store locator application that they build, and they use GraphQL. If you read that uh, all the replies, someone says, hey, is this just US? And yeah, they said US and only two other markets. But hold on, you know, a store locator is not very different here or anywhere in the world. We, we just need to, you know, use the same kind of uh, APIs to find that store. So it, it tells you a little bit, you know, maybe it's more workloads, not able to manage the workload that uh, other, uh, other locations may provide. Who knows? But, you know, Somehow the application faced some challenges that were not able to deploy elsewhere. Um, a story on Twitch that I found is like someone found the GraphQL endpoint seems to have been dedicated for partners. Someone wanted to use it. And uh, they say, well, no, not really. Uh, well, documentation is available, we know that, but uh, you can use it. And uh, if you read the story later on, you see that uh, they actually waive the terms of services and says you may lose your keys if you try to use that GraphQL endpoint. So again, there, there's some governance that they were not ready to, 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 to handle um, on that uh, Twitch API um, for others to, to use. And in the PayPal case, when you read their story, at, at one point they talk about, you know, remember GraphQL is still an API. 
And they said, you want to make sure that you have sufficient logging, retry, circuit breaker patterns, rate limiting, and query complexity check. The first view we, we've seen before, the last one, query complexity checks is, is a little different. But we know as GraphQL users what that means. Each query is a little different. Each query can carry different, uh, different um, meaning. And they actually, um, they, they actually can uh, uh, overwhelm the backend depending on what it tries to do. And so rate limiting now is a little different. Uh, it's not just how many requests per, per, per minute. Um, and I may need to, DDoS has a different meaning. Um, we need to figure out when it's time to block someone. And, uh, but I also have uh, to do trade-offs because I, I may want to let that uh, request go through because I am trying to uh, uh, you know, monetize my service. Here's a very simple query, not too big. Yet that could potentially create, you know, this payment detail supposedly is doing an external API call. And uh, this could potentially do millions of external calls and it doesn't look that, uh, 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 you know, complex or, or aggressive in, in some way. So you, what, what can you do when you have this request? So you could just send the request to the back in the same way you've been always doing it. And uh, you have several approaches when you get on the back end. You can time out, you can process and, and, and process your, your request until after a period of time and time out. Or you can start adding up the, the resources you're consuming or the, the amount of data you're, 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 you're building in your, um, in your response. And at some point, create uh, uh, decide to abort when you pass certain thresholds and decide you have reached some limits. But what happens there is that you basically have used the resources of your backend. You are probably returning partial data or, you know, and, and so it's, it's, it's dangerous because I can still send lots of requests to your backend. I can still potentially, you know, get all these requests to time out and, and not, not the best thing. So alternatively, you could have analyzed that request before it hit your backend. You could have analyzed it and decide, look, there is too many levels of nesting the cost of this is, is probably going to be uh, more than what I'm allowed to give you. And, and, and so you could start thinking about policies. You can think about parsing that request and create uh, something that gives you a uh, uh, first level of parsing on it to, to assess how big, uh, how many levels of nesting or how big the parameters are. Or you can, um, and parse and validate that GraphQL request and understand you know, how much data potentially you may be retrieving and how, many, how much compute you could potentially be using it and compare that against the policies that you're entitled to. And with that, you know, meet or see if you meet your, your rate policy and, 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 and then decide if you wanna let that request go to the backend. So how, how would that work? Well, we, propose to enhance what we all know and love uh, in the API management layer, a GraphQL API management layer that is able to basically uh, proxy all those requests and decide whether or not they will go to the backend. So how does that work? So the, the, the proxy layer talks to the backend and introspect that's, uh, that's uh, available. It knows what APIs to offer. That same introspection is passed to the client. Um, now, uh, it also knows how the middle layer is going to behave. So it's able to assess um, the different um, uh, analysis for those um, queries that are getting prepared. And at some point, the client is going to decide to issue a request. Um, the request is going to hit the gateway. And basically, it's going to get parsed. It's going to get validated um, through the static analysis. And the different policies are going to get checked. If the gateway decide that this request meets the, 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 the associated policies to that client, basically it decides to send them. Uh, the request gets processed and on return, then we compare, we can reconcile and see if what we thought, uh, what, what we were charging for this request was accurate. Because the best this gateway is gonna be able to do is create an upper bound 
but as long as that upper bound is tight, as long as that upper bound uh, it, it, it resembles what the API is a potentially able to collect, then maybe we all we need to do is credit back what was not used. And if we do that, we can continue to manage the rate limits and continue to basically protect those backends. And of course, send the information back. So to finish, I think that the way we think about GraphQL management, there's a number of capabilities that take a new shape. I think there is, of course, the, that, that um, need of uh, security, uh, being able to identify the client so then you can understand what the uh, policies associated with that client are. Uh, but now you need to think about threat protection, figuring out how to what parameters are relevant to you based on, on how your data is, is laid out. Uh, it could be the depth of that query or the size of the parameters, or there's many others you could think of. You can do a more detailed analysis, a complexity analysis. We, we like to think of two types of uh, analysis um, that you could do. One was on, on the types or, or the object that you may obtain. So think about how many data elements I'm gonna get back on my response. And the other one is what does it cost to compute those, those, uh, those um uh, those data elements. And that basically is almost like a, a, a way for the provider to assess the execution cost of that request. Think about the number of resolvers that potentially is gonna get called. Some resolvers may be more expensive, some resolvers may be straightforward or may, not, or may be part of uh, another one. Uh, you can then have runtime limits adjusted to the, to the outcomes of this complexity. Um, of course, you can think having that layer in the middle, you can help you virtualize your data. You can create subsets of a given API, a given schema to be uh, something that you offer, um, protect certain fields perhaps, or manage scopes based on, 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 on the user that's requesting it. And of course you get your analytics. Your analytics gives you the, the metering or how you've been using the, 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 the service and, and the added benefit, of course, that what schema is getting used, which is always a good, uh, uh, a good bonus. So you start to understand, you know, operations you may not need or operations that uh, need to be reinforced with additional backend power. So in essence, we, 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 we can do that alone with how GraphQL is today. We, we need to augment with some configuration information. Uh, that's not that terrible because at least the provider and the provider understand what, how uh, its backend works and, and, and knows what it costs. So it could easily augment that. We uh, believe by, by doing that static analysis, we can query um, the request prior to execution and say if we allow them. And ultimately, we can reconcile the responses to make sure that we update the limits, the rate limits, and the, the analytics that come with it. Conclusion, um, I think GraphQL is redefining the way client-server interactions happen. It's definitely changing the development culture of enterprises. And I think it's enabling how and, you know, providers can start talking to their larger ecosystem. And by bringing GraphQL uh, API management into the mix, I think uh, we're basically gonna uh, reinforce uh, to basically create, enable those drivers um, with, with this technology so that we can protect our backends and, and respond to our client needs. Um, it's been actually very gratifying to see uh, several companies uh, in this conference uh, talking about this very special aspect of uh, the flow of our request. And uh, of course, we at IBM are very much uh, working and uh, had delivered uh, a few weeks back uh, add-ons to API Connect or, 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 or API management layer, um, the support for GraphQL. Thank you so much. And I will take any questions. So we probably have time for like one question uh, and then... Uh... <laughs> for the break before our final talk. Uh, do we have, do we have any specific question here? Let's just take a look. Anything specific? These are great uh, architectural patterns um, and a lot of important things to bear in mind. 
looks like people just enjoyed it <laughs> uh great um yeah that was a, a great talk and so really appreciate you being able to make it i'm glad that the thunderstorms uh stayed away <laughs> And uh, the anecdotes of companies embracing GraphQL at scale is always an, an important thing to see. Um, can API management facade GraphQL? Can API management facade GraphQL API management? If I were to guess so, the question. Mm -hmm. So, right. I, I think I understand what he's trying to say. Yeah. Um, so, you sure can put an API man API management today, but all you're gonna do is meter the request. You you're just gonna get a post and you're gonna send that post to the backend, and you're not gonna understand what that request is. I mean, GraphQL the the value is in the request, is on the content of that request. Well, in in with REST, we were able to do that just with the basically the signature of the request, uh, or, or with within with the name of the method in a way. So it, it's not enough. It, it's not enough. It's not going to give you the 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 proper rate limiting. Right? You're not going to be able to protect your backend uh, use of resources, which is key. Uh, you're not going to be able to uh, anticipate a threat. Uh, a very small query. We actually even had. To, I mean, and by the way, people have been doing this. The, 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 those that have exposed APIs have been able to do this, but. Is not they're not doing it with this middle layer. You can see how uh, Apollo is doing it. Um, they have a way to do a rate limit, but your request has reached the the Apollo server. Um, there are rate limits defined um, by by GitHub, for example, Shopify. Um, but th those are proprietary methods that they follow. So I think if you if you want to kind of adopt GraphQL, expose it to others, even internally, then you st need to start thinking. GraphQL API management in some way. Very good. All right, so we will go ahead and break now, and then we will be returning in about 14-ish minutes for a fireside chat with the CEO of Apollo. That is going to be, I think, a very interesting conversation. So uh, I would recommend everybody return for that, and we will see you then. Thank you.